because my mom would constantly be saying, you're not only representing the new family, you're representing the country of Taiwan. And so you have to speak properly, eat properly, dress properly, walk properly, you know, like all these different things. everyone, welcome back to Pride Talk and more of our intimate conversation with Dr. Kim Liu. I'm sure you all are wanting to hear more of her captivating story, just as we were when we were recording the sessions for season number two. And speaking of season two, just wanted to say thank you to our new corporate sponsor, Molson Coors. Because of their generous support, we're able to bring you this new season of Pride Talk, a podcast presented by Nat Pride. Our podcast features in-depth conversations with Asian American LGBTQ plus professionals and our allies. I'm your host, John Ong, and with me is co-host David Moore. Hi, David. So what's in store for our listeners in this episode? Well, hi, John. In our first episode with Dr. Liu, we opened up about discovering her sexuality, her feelings of being different, and the pressures to stay in the closet. In this episode, we continue our conversation with Kim as she shares more of her fascinating story. Dr. Liu talks about what it was like growing up as a child of a diplomat represent the country of Taiwan and the added burden of not only having to represent the family in a positive light, but also an entire country. Wow. And as many of us know, family pride is a huge thing in Asian cultures. And not only family pride, but community pride. We cannot bring shame or any kind of negativity to our family, business, or community. I can't even imagine the pressure to also have to represent your whole country. I know, right? And this led to a discussion of filial piety in Asian cultures and the impact that had on Kim finding and expressing her authentic self and the hardship it created in her relationship with her mother and how this motivated her to seek out colleges that would take her far away and provide some distance. So... What could have possibly happened for Kim to end up at a religious college that she didn't even apply to? Ooh, let's find out. How was your upbringing, your Asian culture, Asian part of the family, as well as the, the cultures that you grew up in in Latin America, how did those two cultures um, affect your um, accepting your own sexuality? In the Hispanic culture, um People, it, as a culture thing, now it might be a bit different, but growing up, there was a lot of hate towards homosexuals, especially gay men. There's, it, if someone was effeminate, um, in general, people would make fun of them or use that word as an insult. Mm -hmm. um, either the word gay or this is a Spanish word called marica, which means effeminate, I believe. And th that was the insult word. So I grew up knowing about gay men but i didn't really know about lesbians or female version you know um so that subconsciously in my mind was okay that's different and that's not good because then people will as a group people will turn against you mm -hmm. um in terms of the asian part of me that one was kind of hard because the reason i was in latin america my parents were diplomats yeah. and um during that pride i I spoke a little bit about it. Um, we were, my family, we were not just oh, Asian people in Latin America. We were a family that's representing a country. Mm -hmm. And so we used to have yearly or, or, or bi-yearly reviews, the entire family, not just my dad, of how he's doing with his job, but like the children and the wife. And are we living up to the standards of representing a country? So in a way, we, we had to keep a certain standards. Um, you know, like have perfect score, behave the right way, speak the right way, you know, and it was very, almost like living in a fishbowl. People would constantly be looking at you, how you're behaving. You don't want to draw negative attention to the family because it's not just a family. We're representing a whole country, you know. So that was very stressful yeah, <laughs> growing up I mean, with that background. That is <laughs> under a microscope of what a, a regular, like a lot of my, um, Many of my Asian friends go through mm -hmm. that because of they mm -hmm. have to 
represent the family name and yes. the pride of mm-hmm. the family, and not only and for you, not only that, you have to kick it up a few notches to yes. the the country, you know, like the the, mm-hmm. the Taiwan. How how are mm-hmm. people? I guess you're representing essentially the the country of Taiwan. Yes, exactly. And so there were a lot of things. The upbringing was very strict. Um, it was interesting. I remember hearing about. You know, in, especially in America, they talk about like tiger moms, or you know how Asians are very strict, and that's how it was in a stereotypical kind of way. Because um, my mom would constantly be saying, "You're not only representing the new family, you're representing the country of Taiwan," and so you have to speak properly, eat properly, dress properly, walk properly. You know, <laughs> like all these different things. And you know, a, a female should act this way, a male should act this way, and. If, and it was interesting because my father was not like that. He didn't care. Uh-huh. <laughs> Him being the person that's actually working on the government, he didn't care. He would take me hiking, and I'm, I'm the first child. Um, and he didn't have any issue about stereotypes or gender stereotype or what females or males should do. He uh-huh. didn't think that was an issue. But my mom was the one that kept saying, you know, you have to act a certain mm-hmm. way. You're, you know, act as a proper lady or, you know, don't sit a certain way. You know, you have to wear clothes a certain way. You have to speak a certain way. And that kind of like prepared me. And she would sometimes say things like, you know, one day when you marry, you have to be a certain kind of way. And I'm like, what? I don't want to marry. Why should I marry someone if I have to pretend? to be somebody else like for me i was so against marriage and yeah it was you, <laughs> it was so bad so do you do you what part of uh your mom's uh i don't know is it culturally or is it her responsibility what do you think made your mom kind of instill that in you wanting to, to i think for her she was afraid for me like she could see how different i was uh. and she like herself she's already different in, in this in the sense that she's mixed you know she's she's not full asian per se and my grandparents come from a time where there's a lot of tension between japan and taiwan because of the war yeah. and my mom having japanese blood my father's yeah. side of the family did not accept her at all uh-huh. so they made her life very difficult and so she was afraid if i ever you know, in her mind, of course, I'm going to marry someone. And of course, it has to be an Asian man. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so She's thinking, you know, I marry an Asian man and my mother-in-law is going to treat me a certain kind of way if I don't act a certain kind of way. So, like, right. I think that's the way that she was thinking. And she was just very afraid for me mm-hmm. in so many different ways because she, she felt that I was in her mind. I was rebellious. I was going to get in trouble. And yeah. the way I spoke, perhaps, or that I spoke my mind, um, I used to get my parents in trouble you know, not on purpose, but I was very outspoken and very straightforward. Mm-hmm. Um, as a child, as some of the functions for the embassy, I would ask questions to people. I mean, I was very curious. And I remember an incident of a lady, she had painted eyebrows. And that I found that very interesting. And I asked her, oh, why does your eyebrows look different than mine? You know, like, what is it? <laughs> and my mom's like, you cannot say that. That's the ambassador's wife. You know, <laughs> like, yeah, you can't say that kind of stuff. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay. He's <laughs> uh, like, just sit there, stay quiet. Don't talk to people. If people ask you something, you don't know anything. <laughs> you know? I'm like, okay. <laughs> but, you know, that, that was the kind of environment I grew up. And I, I think, you know, now as an adult looking back, I think she was very afraid of, for me, you know, she wanted to protect me. She didn't yeah. want me to go through some of the suffering that she herself went through as being different. Yeah. You know, so that, I think it was like out of motherly love, not so much because she didn't accept me yeah. or whatnot. She was just wanted to protect me. And that's a good point to be brought up also, especially for um, people with parents who want to protect them out of love, but then giving yes. some, sometimes those signal could be sent as as when you were a child, you may not understand that all you heard was, why do you want me to be different from who I am? Yes. Uh, we have mm-hmm. to, if we can think a little bit more about where they are coming from, like where the parents are coming from, that yes. makes your, the both of your relationship coming together, um, finding the common place a little bit easier so that you can have a yes. civil conversation about that. Yeah, it was rough growing up. My, I, I remember thinking, maybe I'm adopted. You know? <laughs> maybe I don't belong to this family. And that's why she's trying so hard to break me down and make sure I'm like them. You know? <laughs> like, I don't understand. <laughs> yeah, it, but, um, it's always yes. tough because you're you're also struggling with trying to find your own 
identity in the world at that time. Yes. So, Mm -hmm. you know, you're, you're struggling against that and they're trying to protect Mm -hmm. you, but you're trying to say, I am me and I'm going to find my way. So it's always, do you guys, okay. So I'll open this up to everybody. Do you find Mm -hmm. that it, because of the, the, the Asian culture, because of how we look at our elders, we -hmm. have to like almost, if you follow the, the the traditional value, the the filial piety um, rule. You are supposed to be agreeing with them no matter what. Uh, the parents, no matter what. And I think sometimes the, the newer generation sometimes don't want to break out of that a little bit. Do you find that part of the Asian culture being a, a an additional friction for us when it comes to? identifying ourselves um our own sexuality having to go through all that because whatever your parents say should technically be correct and i'm not going to go against my parents tell tell us uh, you guys everybody david and and kim share your opinion on that how did you see that as an additional struggle i think it was for me um that was definitely an additional struggle with everything else that I had going on. Um, I didn't know how to stand up to my mom. I had a lot of conflicts with her. And I felt that I thought either she doesn't love me or she doesn't accept me for who I am because I constantly felt she wanted to change me and mold me and for me to be a certain kind of way. Um, It made it really difficult to have a good relationship with her, even though I know we love each other, but that's just, I couldn't talk to her Mm. and seeing my friends, how close they are with their mothers. um, I wanted that, but I didn't know how to do it because I felt that I'm constantly disappointing my mom. Um, Yeah. I didn't know how to be myself, express myself and, like I felt like I had to hide a lot of time so that I wouldn't cause conflict with her. Mm. And that was, that made it difficult finding out who I am as a person, not only my sexuality, but everything like, who am I? Yeah. And uh, for the longest time I felt like I had to conform and because yeah. of the first problem was right here at home, <laughs> you know, <Yeah. laughs> forget about the world yeah. and school and whatnot. Like the first problem was at home yeah. having to hide who I am from my own mother. Um, I found that very, very hard and thinking and feeling a a sense of wrongness. You know, I'm doing something wrong because I don't agree with what she says. I don't agree with her belief. Like something must be wrong with me um, that I'm fighting so hard. And and part of me, I I was fighting with myself too. Sometimes I'll say, just go with it. Why are you being so difficult? Everybody else is doing fine. Why do you have to be? different you know why why are you not okay with that you know you should be happy just go with the flow it's so much easier and then the part another part of me would be like no i don't want to that's yeah. not who i am even though i didn't know who i was i'm like just just doesn't sit yeah. right doesn't you know feel right you know it's mm-hmm. you know you are different too right i mean it innately yeah. you know you're different yeah and i think that that's the the struggle that that we all go through is sometimes you haven't really learned or know especially especially you're only in your early or mid-teens right you don't really mm-hmm. know exactly how to put those into words yet but you know yes. you're different and it's very suffocating when you have mm-hmm. to conform and just yes. swallow and just yeah. be right like just follow mm-hmm. whatever whatever it, because you feel like you're not living your own truth and yes. I think one of the yes. hardest thing for me before i came out was every day for me was a lie Every yes. action, mm-hmm. every every the way I walk, the way I smile, the way I laugh, the signature laugh that I have right now, the cackle, <laughs> like all that, everything yeah. was bad. You know, I just mm-hmm. can sense that I know people are gonna disagree with me on on, on the way I walk, the way I talk, the way I laugh. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. it's it's very tiring um, mm-hmm. in a way. Yeah, and, but also I think being growing up in an Asian home, at least in my home, mm-hmm. my mom mm-hmm. taught me very early your identity she didn't say it that way but the message i got was doesn't matter while you're in my house Mm -hmm. it -hmm. doesn't matter so i think i suppressed all that until after i moved out because Mm -hmm. yeah i I was one of those ones that learned really (laughs) early because it and it wasn't so much about respecting the elders i mean that was Mm -hmm. there but it was more about do not bring shame upon this family 
Yeah. So anytime yeah. we were going out, it was like, don't you embarrass mm-hmm. me? Don't you bring shame mm-hmm. on this family? Don't you, you know, so I learned really early. And mm-hmm. so I suppressed, it wasn't until after I moved out of the house and then it was like, mm-hmm. okay, now I can be me and start figuring yes. out who, who I am. But yeah, mm-hmm. that was very strong growing up. And, and um, I guess also the pressure of being the, the first son you yeah, know, they and, and then having to carry that family name, the family name and the yeah. respect and all You're that. You're the eldest too, right, Kim? Yes, I'm the eldest as yeah. well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, for me it was, yeah, very similar to David about, you know, as long as I'm in my parents' house, it's their room, you know. And um, it's very much so I couldn't really express myself. I couldn't really be myself, even though... Again, I didn't know who I was. I just know I was different. I was different than my siblings. I was different than my mom. And also that my mom would say, like, if you act like this, your siblings are going to follow after you. And then yeah. everybody's yeah. going to be doing the same thing you're doing. And it's going to be shame upon the family. And you're going to ruin them. <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. And so she was trying so hard to break me down because she was so afraid that every single one of us, there's four of us in my family, that all of us were going to turn like me, you know, <laughs> like the black sheep. And she's like, and you know, typical, she would blame it on my, my dad's side of the family. It's like, oh, you have that bad blood from that side of the family. That's why you're <laughs> acting like this. <laughs> like, what? And what does that mean? <laughs> but yeah, I just felt like I, I couldn't, and similar to you, John, like I couldn't dress the way I wanted to. Yeah. And growing up, I was a bit more tomboyish. You know, I don't know if it's because I grew up more with boys or is it because my dad didn't really care about gender roles. Yeah. Um, you know, he'll take me fishing, he'll take me hiking, teach me all sorts of sports. And I, w- I had a very close relationship with my dad. And so that's how I grew up. I didn't think there was anything wrong with playing sports, you know, but then if I, whenever we go to Taiwan for visit, my great grandfather would yell at my mom for the way I was behaving. You know, he'll be saying that, Oh, that this child is bringing shame upon the family. Look at how she's sitting or how she's eating or, you know, why is she climbing a tree? <laughs> you know, uh-huh. things like that. And my mom would take the fall for it. Cause they wouldn't tell my dad, they'll tell my mom. Yeah. And so she would be the one to get yelled at by the elders of how True. I was behaving. So I'm sure she had a lot of pressure from that as well. Yeah, traditionally, uh, a, like a woman, it it is her role to be, to be teaching the the children how to behave mm-hmm. at home, the, and yes. and then the the father is the one who's making money outside the yeah. home. So, mm-hmm. and and your mom already have that pressure of being an outsider for mm-hmm. having yes Japanese, and the, I think it was very hard for her too. Um, cause she didn't conform with anything. I mean, you know, she's a role model for me regard, regardless of all this friction I had with her uh-huh. growing up. I mean, she was, you know, one of the first female CEOs in Japan, you know, mm-hmm. and she used to be in the military and, you know, all these different things that women, her generation didn't do. Yeah. And so she's like a powerful woman as it is, but she would get shamed about it because she was not mm-hmm. conforming into what a proper Asian wife should be like, or a proper Asian mother should be like, yeah. you know? So she struggled on her own about a lot of these things about not conforming. And I think because of her own experience of not being similar to her peers, yeah. she was afraid that it was going to fall on me. Yeah. Cause out of all four children, I was the one that was in her mind, very rebellious, you know, and not conforming. <laughs> so she was afraid for me. And that was her way of, keeping me in check or protect me, you know, yeah, yeah, to yeah. not go through the same thing she did. Right. You know what that reminds me of a little bit of? Um, mm-hmm. the You know how, sorry, Crazy Rich Asians reference again. You know, like the <laughs> Eleanor's character, right? That, like, I really like how they kind of like make her, her character that to have mm-hmm. more human um, mm-hmm. uh, uh, like depth to it there are more facets to <laughs> why she's yeah. the way she is because mm-hmm. how she was being treated when she was you know into yes. her family you know mm-hmm. that kind of make me think and then for you are super protective of your own children yes. so that you don't mm-hmm. have to go through that yes very interesting very thanks for sharing that part of the story it's, it's, it's very cool um, <laughs> what about now, your early adulthood, you know, um, when did you start exploring? You said you were in college or second for second year mm-hmm. of college. That's when you were introduced by a friend yes. about uh, being mm-hmm. uh, of the LGBTQ community. 
Yes. So, interestingly enough, um, when I was, I felt like I was exploring and, I mean, I left home when I was 15. I got a scholarship. I'm like, I don't want to deal with being in the suppression of my family. <laughs> <laughs> I went to a far college, you know, seven hours away from my house. Um, we moved to a, a country because we I was in Honduras when I graduated from high school. And in a way, we all have to go back to Taiwan. So I'm like, okay, fine. If I'm going to Taiwan, I'm going to choose the farthest college from home as I can, <laughs> which was seven <laughs> hours away. So I was there for two years and that's when I was exploring. But people still kind of knew who I was. Um, you know, my family and all of that. And so I still felt that people were constantly watching me. Mm -hmm. And so after two years, I said, you know what? Taiwan is not for me. I don't feel very Taiwanese. I don't feel very Asian, even though the, my whole life people said I was Asian when I was in Latin America. Mm -hmm. And so I told my parents, I want to go to a different school in a different country. And they said, okay, if you find a scholarship and they can sponsor you then sure i applied to so many schools in in the u.s and dominican republic and europe and the one school that i was sent to was byu hawaii as a mormon school a school <laughs> i did not apply to oh wow <laughs> my parents went behind my back <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> they submitted that for me oh my goodness <laughs> <laughs> I was like, wait a minute, what, what is this school? I never applied to this school, <laughs> you know, I don't know if they were concerned about my personality or somehow it got to them that how I was behaving in school because they shipped me to a church school. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, oh, you're going to go to that school. And I remember thinking, what in the world, why am I going to a church school? And yeah. one of the things I had to sign to be able to go to school was an honor code. And yep. one of the things that it says in there is you will not engage in homosexual behavior. If you do, you get kicked out of school. So I'm like, great, oh. I'm going back in the closet. <laughs> yeah, I had to sign one too. So a Mormon college with an honor code. Having attended a religious college myself, I can relate. I wonder how many of our listeners have had a similar experience. Share your comments with us about our conversation with Dr. Liu. You can email us at pridetalk at nap.org. You can even call us and leave a voice comment. Our number is 4197-PRIDE5. That's 4197-P-R-I-D-E-5. And of course, you can find all this information in the show notes as well as on our website, pride.nap.org. And a quick shout out to NAP, the National Association of Asian American Professionals, which is a nonprofit organization that cultivates and empowers Asian and Pacific Islander leaders through leadership development, professional networking, and community service. Check them out at nap.org. That's n triple a p dot org. We also want to thank our corporate sponsor Molson Coors for their continued support of NAP Pride and this podcast. And for their commitment to fostering open and inclusive workplaces where all employees are valued, engaged, and inspired to be the best they can be. Please join us for our next episode where Kim goes very personal and discusses attraction, chemistry, and intimacy with men and being introduced to the transgender community. Join us next time as we continue the conversation with Dr. Kim Liu. Until then, remember this, representation matters. So be seen, be heard, be loud and be proud. Yes. Bye, everybody. Bye. The opinions expressed on Pride Talk are solely those of the host and guests and do not represent the views or opinions of our individual employers, NAP, or our sponsors.